All right, so this last video for chapter six um, covers like orbital motions and yeah, orbits. All right, so when we look at this, we talked about projectiles before as something being launched and the only thing pulling it back to the ground is gravity. So if we think about this for a moment, so we have an object that's gonna, we're gonna launch it with an initial horizontal speed of 15 meters per second. It goes that far. If we make it go faster, It travels farther okay because it has an initial a, a greater initial horizontal velocity okay but the the because this height is consistent its falling time is always going to be consistent okay but what if we took this to a bigger scale what if we looked at an object being launched from the earth and we can make it go incredibly we can make it speed up greater and greater, and it's going to go farther and farther. The theory com comes in that if we can fire this thing fast enough, it'll go around the Earth because the, the, the horizontal velocity would be so great by the time that the, the object would be pulled completely to the surface, it would go all the way around. If we keep going faster, the object's going to curve more. Okay. And this kind of thought experiment has been done over over time. Okay. But it's not just a thought experiment anymore. We can the, the, I'm going to you have the math skills to figure out how fast an object would go would have to go to be put into orbit at a given radius around the circle. And you get one that looks like this. If there was nothing in the way, that object would go all the way around the Earth. Okay, so again, if it was sufficiently large, there comes a point when the curve of the trajectory matches the curve of the Earth. Okay. Now let's look at how to figure out the math for this. So the only force pulling it into the in, keeping it in the orbit is the acceleration due to gravity. G. Okay. And again, acceleration is force divided by mass. Okay, the force is your weight. Weight is mass times gravity divided by mass, which then gets you G is your acceleration. Okay, so an object moving in a circle of a radius R will have a speed of orbit. We'll have, we'll have this if the centripetal acceleration is equal to G. Okay, so the rate of change of position is your acceleration to gravity. And acceleration, centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. So that means V squared over R, if you can get it equal to acceleration to gravity, you can figure out how fast it's going to travel. It needs to travel to put it into orbit. So if you know your, you know your radius, you know the acceleration to gravity in that, in that particular location, you can figure out how fast it's going to go. Okay. So folks who put like satellites into orbit, they figure this out relatively simply. They know their orbit. They know at that point what the acceleration of gravity is because as you go up, the gravitational acceleration decreases due to the, in, the, the increased distance of the, in the gravitational field, but they can figure that out. So, if we could put it just over the surface of the smooth airless Earth, okay, the orbital speed would be the acceleration of gravity times the radius of the Earth, okay, which would be about 18,000 miles per hour. And we could use that speed to figure out the orbit or the orbital period to see how long it would take to go all the way around. Okay. Now, when you when you travel like this, you're going you're in an, you're in an object that's going orbiting around the Earth. You end up in a say what's called free fall. You fall at the same rate as everything else. Okay. 
Astronauts and their spacecraft are in free fall. They're falling around the planet because they're all falling at the same rate. They, you float because you don't have a net force pushing you up. You will float with your aircraft. All right. So the moon, like all satellites, are falling around the Earth. Okay, they're in, it's in orbit. Okay, we know the distance of the moon. Distance of the moon divided by the orbital speed will get you your period. Okay. All right. So we can use this to figure out the period of something like the moon. Okay. G, mat, like it says, G incredibly decreases over time. So we can't just plug 9.8 in and, and call it good. Okay. So we have this. Phobos is a little moon of Mars. It's a very small moon. has correspondingly small gravity. Okay. Now... Acceleration due to gravity there is 6 millimeters per second squared. Not very big. Okay, it has a radius of 11 kilometers. Okay, what's the orbital speed? Okay, so we can use this. We know the radius is 11 kilometers, so that's 11,000 meters. Acceleration due to gravity, 6 millimeters per second squared, or 0 0.006 meters per second squared. So then again, to figure out the... And the our orbital speed needed. It's just a square root of our acceleration due to, due to gravity times the radius, which gives 8.1 meters per second squared. Not very fast because there's not a whole lot of gravity and it's relatively small. Okay. Now, we mentioned that gravitational acceleration decreases as you get farther away. It's actually part of what's called Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation, or LUG for short. Okay, so gravity is the force that, that attracts all objects. Okay, they're force pairs. So the force from 1 onto 2 is equal to the, the force of from 2 onto 1. They're equal and opposite forces. Okay, they are inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the objects. So that means if you double the distance between, the the force, the force between them is 1 over 2 squared or 1 fourth as much. Okay? And they are directly proportional to the products of the two masses. So if you double the masses and you keep the distances the same, if you double both of them, you're going to quadruple the ground of gravitational force. And the, the formula gives you is this. Okay? They're equal forces. Force on the 1 equals force on the 2. Force from 1 on to 2 equals the force of 2 on to 1, which is our law of universal gravitational. Okay. That's what's called an inverse square law. Okay. Where if you double your distance, the force applied is going to be 1 over 2 squared or 1 fourth as much. Okay. So if you, the, the, more far, the farther and farther away you get, the less of force of attraction there are between these two objects. Okay. So gravitational force between two giant lead spheres is one one hundredth of a newton when the centers of the spheres are twenty centimeters apart. What's the distance between them? What's the distance between their centers when the gravitational force between them is 0.16 newtons? Okay. So really you got to figure out how many how many times more greater than is 0.16 newtons than 0 0.01 newtons. And if you just do that by the by a simple division, you'll see that it's 16 times greater. Okay, so if it's if the force increases by 16, according to the inverse square law, if the force increases by 16 times, the distance has to be has to decrease has to be decreasing by one over 16 squared or one fourth as much. So 20 meters divided by four it gives you a distance of five meters. Okay, so one fourth as much distance gets you 16 times greater force. Okay, all right, so you're seated on your physics class next to another student 0.6 meters away. You could estimate the magnitude of the gravitational force between you. Um, student that you have a mass of 65 kilograms. Okay, so again, we're going to look at you as spheres. It's not a good model, but for the, for the sake of this, we can look at distances from your center. So the distances from your centers is 
60 centimeters, 0.6 meters away. And assume you each have a mass, an average mass of about 65 kilograms. Okay. So G is the, what's called the universal gravitational constant. So we take the universal gravitational constant times your two masses divided by your distance squared. And we have a really, really small force. Okay. Really, really small force. You're not going flying at each other because the force acting on you two, be interacting between you two is much greater or much, much smaller than the force between you and the earth. Okay, if you travel to another planet, your mass would be the same, but your weight would vary. The, again, the remember your mass is the amount of material in an object. The weight is that force acting on an object. Okay, we can use force equals gravitational constant times the product of the masses divided by r squared. Okay, g. Okay, you can actually rearrange this because. Instead of force on moon, you can look at this as your weight. So mass times acceleration due to gravity over here. Okay, because we have the mass of U on both sides. The mass of U cancels out. And then the acceleration on the planet can simply be the gravitation of the planet times the mass of the planet divided by the radius of the planet squared. Another form of the derivation that you should probably be able to do. Okay, so again... Little g is acceleration to gravity. Big G is the con the gravitational constant. Okay. All right. So again, Mars. We look at the moons of Mars again. Each smaller than the Earth's moon. The smaller of the two, what's called Deimos, isn't quite spherical, but we're going to look at it anyway. Um, so it has a radius of 6.3 kilometers, a mass of 1.8 times 10 to the 15 kilograms. At what speed would a projectile move in a very low orbit on Deimos? So we're going to put it into orbit, figure out its orbital speed. Okay, so we can use little g is big G times m over r squared to figure out acceleration to gravity on Deimos. We know universal gravitational constant, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. We know the mass of Deimos, and we know the radius of Deimos. Gravitational constant times mass divided by radius squared gets your acceleration due to gravity on Deimos is really, really small, 0 0.003 meters per second squared. Really small. So there's your acceleration. Okay, so we have our acceleration to gravity. We're going to use our orbital velocity formula. Um, gravitational acceleration times your radius. Take the square root of that. Get you your speed really really small okay you'd have to be moving at 4.3 meters per second about 10 miles an hour to push you in orbit around demos not very much okay so we're going to put these two bowling, two bowling balls right next to each other they each weigh 16 pounds each have a diameter of 8.5 meters Okay, they're right next to each other. What's the gravitational force? Okay, you can convert pounds to meters, and the mass of each ball is about 7.3 kilograms. You convert inches inches to meters, that's about 0.22 meters. Okay, about 0.11 meters, both of them. Okay, because you have the diameter of 8.5 meters. So the diameter of one is how far apart the two centers are. So that's 0.22 meters. Okay, the force is going to be yeah, 2 times 10 to the negative 8th newtons. Okay. Last section, we're looking at gravity in orbit, kind of what we already talked about. All right. So we have a, we have a, a, force, a force in orbit. So there's some centripetal force, kind of your gravitational force, okay, occurs. So we have two, for, we have the force of the, the, the planet on whatever is orbiting it, and the reverse, the force of the, whatever is orbiting on the planet, and they are equal and opposite. Okay. And we can solve, we can solve for the speed here, okay. 
So up here it says the satellite must have a speed of the square root of gm over r to maintain an orbital radius. Okay, think about this. So we know that the force of m on little m is this, okay? The force of little m on little m is going to be equal to the same, is going to be the equal to the opposite force. Well, this is also mass times acceleration to gravity. So we can say, and we know the centripetal acceleration is mass times velocity squared over r. So we can set mv squared over r equal to gmm over r squared. The m's cancel. You have only have one r, one r remains because it can cancel with the other one over here. So for solving for v, it's just gm over r equals v squared. And you get this, what's called your orbital velocity. It comes from looking at de deriving formulas to get this. So this is the speed an object has to have in order to main orbit around a larger object. Okay. So for a planet orbiting the sun, the period is the time it takes to complete an orbit. Okay, if we look at the relationship of speed, radius, and period in the same in any kind of circular motion. So we have this. You, so we've done this a lot now. Angular or tangential speed is two times two pi times the radius divided by your period. Combining that, combining that with the value of v for circular orbit, we get this. Okay, so we have. 2 pi r over t is equal to this if it's an orbit, square root of gm over r. So we rearrange this to solve for t. Okay, so again, you square both sides and you rearrange it. You're going to get this to how to find the period, the time it takes an, an, an object to orbit. And this is one of Johannes Kepler's laws of motion. Okay. Again, formula deriving. We took a, a one known formula and another known formula. And because they're solving for the same variable, we could set them equal to each other. We rearrange and solve for t. Okay. Communication satellites, some appear to hover over one point. They're called geosynchronous or geostationary. Um, we're going to figure out the orbit of such a satellite. So basically it's, it's orbit is a 20 is 24 hours. Okay. So we know it's orbit is 24 hours, 8.64 times 10 to the fourth seconds. Okay. So we know it's, we know it's period. We can solve for the mass of the earth. We know acceleration to We know the universal gravitational constant and we know pi. So we just rearrange and solve for r. Okay. So we rearrange that initial equation to solve for r. Okay. We know the mass of the Earth. We know the universal gravitational constant. We know four pi squared. We can calculate that. We figured out our period. We rearrange the equation. Solve for r. 4.22 times 10 to the 7th meters. Okay. So, 7 times the radius of the Earth, which is quite big. Okay. It's a lot higher than the International Space Station. Now, we looked at big gra gravi gravitational scales, like, uh, like galaxies, all right? But there's always gravitational interaction between things. You and everything else in the universe is gravitationally attracted. Okay, it's just how far apart are you determines how gravitationally attracted you are to certain things. Okay. Every galaxy is held together by a gravitational force. Okay, so they all have different orbital periods, they're all different different locations, but they're all held together by gravity. Okay. 
and we can figure out the gravitational force acting on everything simply by using the gravitational force is equal to the gravitational constant times the product of the two masses divided by their distance squared. You can figure out the gravitational forces acting on it. Okay, so we have this one again. Looking back to Mars. Okay. So we, we have the orbit of Phobos. Okay, look, orbiting Mars. Mars has a mass of 6.4 times 10 to 23 kilograms We're, that we want to try to figure out phobos's orbital period and how does this compare to the length of martian day which is just 25 hours all right so we know the radius we know the radius of orbit okay phobos is 9 9400 kilometers from the center of mars like it says up here 9400 kilometers 9.4 times 10 to the 6 meters. Okay. We know the mass of Mars. Okay. So we can use this. We know the radius. We know the mass. We can solve for the orbit. The orbital period. Okay. And when you do that, you get the period is 2.8 2 times 10 to the fourth seconds. Okay. So Phobos month, the month is how long it takes to orbit around, is less than a Martian day. Okay. Rearranging the equations. All right, that's all the equations for circular motion. That's all, all the videos for this particular unit. Again, make sure you look at the formative assessment, and we'll, we'll see you in class.